Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the 2023 Toronto Perioperative Echo Symposium. And to those who are just joining us today, greetings. It's Sunday, so I'm sure there'll be a few latecomers, but we're going to start and try and stay on time today. Next slide. My name is Annette Vegas, and I'm a staff anesthesiologist at Toronto General Hospital and chair of this year's planning committee. I would like to acknowledge and thank members of this year's planning committee for their efforts in contributing to the development as well as participating in the meeting. You met many of these individuals yesterday and you will meet more today in their role as curators and moderators. A special thanks to Sarah Russell, who is the conference coordinator for tying together all the loose ends. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, this year we tried something unique by thinking outside the box and creating a virtual meeting representing truly the global expansion of echocardiography. I hope you enjoyed the international faculty that presented yesterday. They were truly multidisciplinary with anesthesiologists, surgeons, cardiologists, internists, critical care physicians, and today we'll meet some emergency medicine physicians. They are experts in their field and the forefront of research and writing guideline papers. They are leaders and most of all, they're passionate speakers. The speaker bios are available on the website so check it out and learn a bit more about these individuals. Again, many thanks to the speakers for taking time out of their busy schedules to create and speak at this meeting. Next slide, please. On day one, next slide. We covered three sessions on the left ventricle, extracardiac, tricuspid valve, with groups from Europe, Montreal, and Toronto presenting. These were excellent sessions with great talks and stimulating discussion. I hope you enjoyed these sessions and importantly learned information that you can put into practice. For those of you, myself included, who need more time to digest the talks, remember the recordings will be available about 10 days after the meeting closes for you to review at your leisure. Next slide, please. Today uh, is day two. Next slide. And today we'll be covering three additional sessions on the mitral valve, structural heart, and POCUS. We welcome groups from South America, Boston, and individuals from across Canada and the US during the POCUS session. Next slide. This meeting is accredited by the Canadian Anesthesia Society for 12 hours of credit. Please remember to fill out your evaluations for your certificate of attendance. We will post a link to yesterday's evaluation as well as today's evaluations in the chat. Please take the time to fill out your evaluations today. The evaluations are important to tell us what you thought of the meeting and importantly to help plan future meetings. The evaluations will be available through a link for one week after the close of the meeting. Next slide, please. I'd like to reintroduce Fatima Mahmoud, who will be working behind the scenes again today to make this magical meeting occur. Thank you so much, Annette. It's a pleasure to be here supporting the second day of the symposium. My phone number is listed here on this slide, but I'm also available through the chat throughout the day. We have session evaluations for each day. I will be posting the evaluation link for yesterday's day in the chat, as well as the evaluation for today. Uh, on the screen, there is a QR code you can scan, but I've also, I, I will also be posting it in the chat. We would encourage you to have the survey open in another browser and try to complete it throughout the day. At the end of each session, we will try to repost the link, but we do recommend to have it open in another tab and get the evaluation done throughout each session. 
For this event, we are using the Zoom webinar platform, which has three elements of engagement and interactivity available. There will be a couple of polls in one of the sessions where you will be able to vote and see results. And we will not have access, so the, pan the participants will not have access to audio and video features. These are disabled to minimize disruptions during this webinar. Please use the chat and Q&A functions to communicate with organizers, presenters, and other participants. I would like to point out an important differentiation between the chat and the Q&A function. We encourage participants to use the chat functions for feedback and dialogue with other attendees. On the other hand, the Q&A button is where you will submit your questions and the moderators will monitor the questions that come in and ask them on your behalf during the designated Q&A sessions. Attendees can also upvote questions submitted in the Q&A tab, so the ones that will be upvoted the most will be um, answered, the, answered first in priority. This is especially important when there are a lot of questions but not enough time during the Q&A session. With this, I'm going to hand it over to the first session's moderators. Thank you. Thank you, Annette. Thank you, Fatima, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Fabio Papa, and I'm a cardiovascular anesthesiologist um, at St. Michael's Hostel in Toronto and also curator of this session. First of all, I'd like to thank you for being here so early on a Sunday morning. Today is the second day of our Toronto Periop T Symposium. Yesterday, we had really great talks, and this morning will be dedicated to the mitral valve and also structural heart procedures. Our first session starts with minimally invasive mitral valve surgery, what the surgeon needs to know, and the key importance to guide the procedure, followed by functional MR, the key assessment and the surgical implications, finishing up with mitral stenosis. If you have any questions for discussion, please use the Q&A at the bottom of the screen so you can discuss them at the end of the session. Without further ado, I would like to introduce to Dr. Zamper, who will moderate the first presentation. Dr. Zamper is um, a good uh, colleague and friend. He is the Cardiac Anesthesia Program Director and Cardiac Anesthesia Fellowship Coordinator at the Western University in London, Ontario. He will retain his MG from the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil, and also completed his anesthesiology residency at the General Hospital of the University of Sao Paulo. Subsequently, subsequently he completed his cardiovascular anesthesia and periop TE, and also an ultrasound fellowship at the London Health Science Center in, uh, at US University in London, Ontario, where he currently works as a staff anesthesiologist and also is the director of the cardiac anesthesia fellowship program. Rafael, thank you so much for being here. I'm gonna hand over to you now. Thank you, Fabio. Uh, I hope you all can hear me and see me okay. Um, yeah, no, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today. I'd like to first thank uh, the organizing committee and Annette for the invitation. It's uh, always a pleasure to be part of a, such an outstanding uh, symposium. Uh, so when we thought about this session, <clears throat> sorry, on minimally invasive surgery of the mitral valve, we decided to invite two speakers, one surgeon to present their point of view and what they expect from our exam, and also one anesthesiologist with significant experience in TE for minimally uh, invasive mitral valve repairs to present their approach on the TE exam in a program that strongly relies on ECHO as a decision-making tool in all phases of the surgery. Uh, so and we'll, without further ado, we'll start this session with uh, Dr. Michael Chu's presentation. Michael is a cardiac surgeon at London Health Science Center in Western University, where he specializes in valve reconstructive surgery, aortic surgery, and transcatheter valve interventions. He very much values his echo partners and feels that they are a critical member of the team, uh, making better as a reconstructive surgeon as uh, echo provides constructive feedback to evaluate outcomes and continuously uh, improve. Uh, thank you, Michael, for being here with us today. And uh, let's start with this presentation. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, I'm um, 
pleased uh, to be able to present to you with uh, Rafa and Hilda, and I'm going to share with you a little bit about how ECHO has an impact on uh, mitral repair and a minimally invasive approaches. These are my disclosures. So uh, we've been fortunate in London uh, to have a wonderful uh, place to work and most importantly, a great team. Um, we've been fortunate to work with uh, so many wonderful cardiac anesthesiologists, uh, residents and fellows. And what we've been able to accomplish is that, you know, we have a very broad and wide uh, offering for minimally invasive, including uh, minimally invasive valvular disease, uh, hybrid operations, uh, general operations and uh, endoscopic conduit harvesting, which we've been doing since 2000. And we've been able to do over 2,400 cases and uh, be able to achieve uh, really excellent uh, outcomes, and we're very proud of that. So with patients who come with uh, mitral regurgitation, we have the whole array to be able to offer them, whether it be open sternotomy repair, minimally invasive endoscopic repair, uh, transcatheter edge to edge repair or uh, some other transcatheter options. And what I'm going to focus specifically on are two uh, areas echocardiographically guided uh, valve repair and the critical role of echocardiography in ensuring safe and effective minimally invasive access. So, this is my area of expertise endoscopic mitral repair, uh, where we use a five millimeter, a zero degree or 30 degree endoscope and uh, use that to be able to repair the mitral valve with some long shaft instruments. And what I'd like to share with you is, you know, how we do this. And, you know, in many cases for us as surgeons, we oftentimes, uh, particularly with our trainees, wonder, you know, how do you get from uh, A to B? Uh, and sometimes things seem uh, unnecessarily uh, complex. Uh, and sometimes it's related just to surgical team experience. But, you know, the reality is, is that when we go to meetings, there's a magic element that's created uh, and there's unnecessarily complicating terminology and techniques. Um, and uh, the reality is that most mitral repairs are really quite simple. Uh, and uh, most of them involve posterior lethal disease, single segment disease. And, you know, there are reproducible techniques that we can use uh, to do these repairs. And in our center, we like to use neoporte loop reconstruction and around 85 to 90 percent of the cases where we find that, you know, you can apply it to posterior lethal disease, anterior lethal disease, uh, commissural uh, disease, bilateral disease, you know, any and all of these combinations and get very good results. The reason that is, is because, you know, the neoporte maximized quotation surface they create a uh, lower gradients and uh, you can really get a nice durable repair. Echo is really the hallmark uh, to how we do these operations. And I'm gonna show you here. What's really most important is that you go through and do a very careful and thorough segmental analysis, both on 2D and 3D, and uh, correlate the regurgitant jets to the segmental findings. And it's this careful analysis that really can allow us as a surgical team to be able to plan the details of the repair so that we're not blind going into the operation. We should have a very comprehensive idea of exactly what we're going to do to each and every segment before we even get into the operating room uh, or before the patients, uh, before we start the operation. And here you can see this, this, this case, you know, you can, yes, we can look at and examine uh, the, the valve with our eyes, but I would argue time and time and time again, that echo is far more accurate than what we can actually visualize with our eyes. Um, and uh, here you can see that based on the TE, I knew exactly that I need to four sets of neoporte loops to the anterior, to the posterior, and uh, following the uh, midline of both between anterior and posterior, and then the midline from medial to lateral and muscle. And here you can see the sort of uh, post repair result on the saline test. You can see a nice competent valve. And most importantly, again, checking on, on the post op repair echo. And you can see that there's nice lambda flow uh, and there's no residual regurgitation uh, with low gradients. So, the most important principle that I'll talk about today is really trusting the echo and not your eyes. And, and this really, you know, is it, it's, it, it tells us, you know, how important. Uh, echo and you as the cardiographers are to us because you know it's much more accurate much more detailed it's a functional assessment uh, rather than trusting what we can identify on the arrested heart uh, you know just by pulling on, on a leaflet with, a, with an instrument um, and so this is where it's important that again I think what I learned on the echo and then I check uh, after uh, with my eyes not the other way around um, and what I, I can't stand or I don't like is the idea of 
heading into an operation without any idea based on what the TV showed beforehand. I think that's just going in blind, adding unnecessary risk and likely prolonging your cross plant at some time unnecessarily. So in terms of neocordium implantation, it's fairly simple and straightforward. You know, you, you choose the most adjacent capillary muscle, and in this case, it's the most medial muscle, attaching the neocordate into it, and then using four broken suture to attach them to the uh, prolapse in the flail segment, which you can see here uh, with separate sutures. And it's really a nice, simple technique. And in this case, you know, I attach some loops posteriorly and anteriorly because of the violent that prolapse, which, uh, which I think you can see uh, here. And um, and able to achieve a, a nice sort of result in the saline test. But again, uh, similarly to what I said before, the saline test is nice, but again, what's most important is press the echo after, not the saline test and stop physiologic. And the echo will tell you exactly to see, you know, is there any residual regurgitation? What's the uh, coaptation height? And what are the gradients? And these are the most important things. So some simple rules, don't cross the midline. Keep anterior to anterior, posterior to posterior. Don't disrupt any new cords. Determining the echo, the, the length of the neocords is, is, you know, there are lots of different ways to do this, but the majority of them rely upon eyeballing, um, and you know, it's trial and error. And I and I make the argument that these measurements are made on the static arrested heart, and that's why you know I think that oftentimes when you do that, you can result in neocords that are too long or too short. Um, either way, results in residual recurrent mitral regurgitation, heart failure, in some cases, hemolysis. And so that's why I think that you know using an echo-based method um, to be able to identify the length is far more accurate. So we use minisoftial views between zero and 120 degrees. You need to be able to visualize, obviously, the flail segment, uh, the adjacent papillary head, and then the uh, the opposing leaflet, uh, and in most cases, the anterior leaflet. And, and it's really to develop a reproducible systematic way to predict the neocordate length to simplify its use in micro repair. So for posterior leaflet prolapse, it's simple. You basically need to rotate that posterior leaflet down and subtract the additional redundant length. Uh, and so basically you measure X from the, from the papillary muscle, the adjacent papillary muscle up to where you want the uh, flail segment to coap with the anterior leaflet, and you subtract that residual portion of the uh, posterior leaflet. So X minus Y equals the posterior leaflet neocordial length. So just to show you that again, here you can see your posterior leaflet flail, um, and you're gonna rotate that down. Uh, to meet with the anterior leaflet. So again, X, which is the distance from the papillary head up to the anterior leaflet, subtract the redundant portion of the posterior leaflet being Y. And in many cases, you'll find that X will be on average between 28 to 30 millimeters, Y will be approximately 10 millimeters, and again, neocordial length around 18 millimeters. For anterior leaflet prolapse, it's rarely, rarely is redundant, so it's simply just measuring from the papillary head to the posterior leaflet. And by leaflet prolapse, is, is simply a combination of the two techniques. And you can see that in our experience, this measurement technique is accurate 98% of the time. And in the five other patients, um, we had to convert them to a resection technique um, and they were able to repair it successfully. And let me show an example. So here's a, an anterior leaflet, a flail patient. I measured a 23 millimeter neocortic, but you can see here there's a reversal of that jet. Um, and, uh, and, and so I was concerned enough that you know, I thought this wasn't going to be a durable repair. So I went back and measured by hand and made it 27 millimeters length. And you can see that resolved PMR. And so my error in, in this case was that I accepted suboptimal windows where I thought that, you know, I saw the papillary muscle and I made the measurement. It actually wasn't the papillary muscle. I just couldn't visualize it well enough. So it's really important to try and optimize those views to be able to see the papillary head, the flail segment, and the anterior leaflet. You can see that the average anterior leaflet neocordial length is around 26 to 30 millimeters, whereas the posterior is about 10, 10 millimeters shorter and around 16 to 20 millimeters. Uh, and the most important thing is the results. Um, so you can see that, you know, out to uh, almost nine years, uh, there's about 90% that are still alive. But what's most important is that the freedom from uh, mitral regurgitation uh, greater than two plus uh, is 98% in nine years. So really quite good with most of the patients in MYJ class one and two, and very few uh, redox or valvular complications. You can see here, just of interest, when I compared uh, minimally invasive versus chronotomy, there was no difference in terms of the quality of repair from recurrent MR, nor was there between survival. 
The, mo the second uh, point is about how echocardiography enables safe and effective minimally invasive access. And I can't stress this point enough. If you're going to do a minimally invasive operation, you need to have superior echocardiography to help guide. So just in terms of the setup, we use a 20 degree left la lateral to keep this position. Um, and what's most important is, you know, the team. Uh, and here you can see one of our anesthesia fellows. And um, this is Jill, uh, my right hand woman and uh, my surgical fellow here. And it's about teaching the team to each take responsibility for each portion um, and to be able to have a seamless transition and save significant time uh, and energy. Um, and so uh, for cannulation, this becomes really important. So. Uh, echo really you know can help to guide both arterial and venous cannulation and you need to frequently recheck you know so this is where it's really important that echo is rechecked throughout the entire pump run um you know every 30 minutes uh, so you check the aorta every 30 minutes make sure there's no dissection you check the uh right atrium to make sure the cannulas haven't moved and they're in a good place and that the right heart isn't filling up uh and that there's good venous drainage so for the neckline, we use a, a, a 16 French uh, percutaneous arterial cannula inside the internal jugular vein, uh, and we have a protocol to do this. And what's most important is that we check on ultrasound, surface ultrasound, you can see both on short and long axis, the wires in the right place. And then by TE, uh, that the wires are inside the heart and the cannula is in the right place. And then after that, you check that the venous drainage is actually working properly uh, from the neckline. And you'll see it here. You have to check it before uh, you go on pump because otherwise you won't see it drain properly like that, okay? Uh, and so there's a checklist and we go through this because, you know, it's a safety mechanism. We do this on every single patient and we put in a neckline in every patient because of a randomized trial that Dan Bainbridge uh, and I had done several years ago where we looked at randomizing patients to um, uh, a neckline clamp or unclamp. Um, and uh, what we found was that there's significantly improved surgical uh, view, there's significantly improved venous drainage, uh, and a much lower CVP. And from this, we feel that uh, a neckline is needed for to support cerebral venous drainage and subsequent brain diffusion in each and every patient. Additionally, uh, we also uh, uh, cannulate uh, most patients with a side graft on the arterial side rather than the cannula to try and reduce the risk for dissection and to main distal uh, leg diffusion. Now, last thing is an important issue that I want to highlight is about avoiding uh, a myocardial protection injury. And this is where echo is really important. So when you give cardioplegia, you need to be there looking at the, uh, looking on echo to make sure that you can see the root fill, uh, that there's not that much AI and that the heart's not distending because the AI uh, is actually you know, shunting the blood away from the coronaries. And this is really, really, really important. And every time you give cardioplegia, you need to make sure that you try and look by echo um, and, uh, and, and that the surgeon looks with direct vision. And so that initial induction dose and the view uh, on echo is really important to look for. And traditionally, most places do not uh, look for this at all. Uh, additionally, you know, one of the things that's, that can be helpful is, is uh, uh, you know, there's all sorts of DRing tricks. And here you can see where after I've repaired the valve, I fill that ventricle with as much fluid as possible, close up the left atrium, uh, and then uh, vent all that air out uh, through the aortic root, which you'll see here. And you look by echo, uh, you know, to be able to see how much air is left in the ventricle and keep venting it. Um, and you can move the bed around so that the air, you know, kind of floats up uh, before removing the cross pump. And this is a small work trip that can really help. So, in summary, echo is really key to planning and executing a perfect micro repair. With careful segment by segment TE analysis, the surgical team should have a comprehensive plan for the operative repair, along with backup plans before starting the operation. Uh, echo guidance is key for safe, minimally invasive access. And as you know, echocardiographers, you guys are the eyes and ears inside the patient that needs to be monitored frequently and often to ensure safe operations. So I'll pass it off now to uh, Hilda and Rafa. Thanks so much. Thank you, Michael, for the great talk. And uh, to follow, I'll invite our next speaker, Dr. Hilda Alfaro, Associate Professor of Anesthesia at Western University, uh, who will present the routine at the point in the point of view of uh, the uh, intraoperative echocardiographer, in this case, the cardiac anesthesiologist. Hilda is a cardiac anesthesiologist at LHSC Western, and she was trained in anesthesiology at CES, uh, University of Columbia, and cardiothoracic anesthesia at UBP, University of Columbia. She also has a master's in professional education at Western University. Thank you, Hilda, for joining us. It's a great pleasure to have you here today. Hello, everyone. 
would like to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me to participate in this symposium and to um, Rafael and Michael to share this lecture with me. So today we're going to talk about what, is, what does the surgeon needs for the minimal invasive mitral valve repair and uh, how does it affect the approach. Uh, already Michael uh, touched in some of the uh, objectives for this presentation. I want to try to cover the rest of them. I have no nothing to disclosure for this presentation. And basically, I want to establish the difference from the TE perspective with the, with the open mitral valve, valve approach. So I want to establish the three important uh, three important things. The number one is um, this: uh, the TE has is going to have a limited time due to the participation of the. Um, so, uh, anesthesiologists in some of the surgical procedures, especially cannulations. And number two, the uh, fact that we need to use one lung ventilation during the procedure, and this is going to limit the quality of our images. And finally, that in order to answer all the questions from um, the surgical surgical team, we need to have a focus a exam uh, to be able to be time efficient. So uh, through the years, we find out that the base approach to be able to accomplish these goals is through a step-by-step -step approach. We de divided the echo in three different, sorry, four different steps. The step no number one is before the neckline is placed. The second step is the placement of the neckline. The third step will be the assessment, the preoperative uh, uh, assessment in the IVC cannulation, and lastly, the assessment of the mitral repair. So for the first step, we need to keep in mind two things. The first one, uh, in our institution, we count with the support of a TE person that is dedicated just to do the TEs during the day, so that person is the one in charge of the TE images. The anesthesiologist in the room is the one performing the procedure. Uh, but we use the same uh, machine uh, for the whole case. So during this step of the T, um, both lungs are gonna be ventilated. So is the quality of the images is gonna be the best. That's the reason why we um, dedicate this time to the more critical information, which is to confirm the um, mitral regurgitation mechanism to measure the new cordae, which is the basic technique that um, our surgeons use in the institution, uh, assess the aortic valve and the tricuspid valve to adjust the surgical plan. Um, so for this uh, first step, we use a lot of 3D images. We have a very good um, car, uh, cardiology, cardiology lab that provides us with excellent uh, echo images for the surgeons to plant in advance uh, the surgical repair. And because the time is limited, we find that 3D provides us with uh, uh, a significant amount of information to try to adjust and modify the surgical um, plan according to, to the findings. Unfortunately, with our patient come after long periods, long periods after the, the preoperative TE has done or some of the patients um, disease has progressed. So we find these um, uh, images help us to complete the plan, the surgical plan. It's unusual that we the surgeon has to change completely uh, their approach based on the on, on the um, the intraoperative images, uh, but it helped the surgeon to refine uh, the plan at this point. And, as we can see in this patient, as a, a prolapse of P2 with the consequent um, findings in the uh, color, uh, and we try to use uh, the most, uh, the best quality of images to help the surgeon. This uh, multi-view is really helpful as with just one image, you can manipulate the angles and the planes in order to cut through the different segments with um, the use of minimal minimal time to the acquisition of the image. And uh, as I mentioned before, the most common thing that happens to us is we have new findings 
adding to what uh, was already identified in the preoperative settings. This patient came for a repair of the P2, and then we find that uh, other segments were compromised and not just prolapsed, but also cleft. Uh, um, some of the sem and some of the segments were found in the interoperative echo. So the modified uh, modifications for the surgical plan were, ma were made at this time. We confirmed the uh, size of the annulus as all the, our surgeons use in top of the new neocordae also uh, an oleoplasty ring. So we confirm uh, the findings through using 2D and 3D for better alignment of the annulus. And uh, we proceed to answer the, the next uh, question, which is the measure of the new cordae. Michael already touched uh, in detail in how they do the measurement. I want to um, emphasize in the uh, structures that we need to have into view in order to have an um, accurate measurement of the cordae. So we need to have uh, the, prolap the prolap segment into view, the annulus, the opposite uh, leaflet in the coaptation sound, and the most difficult thing to find in the same view is the head of the papillary muscle. So according to the pathology, anterior, posterior, white leaflet, we modify uh, the measurements that we do, but we need all the structures for the measurement of any of those um, pathologies. Usually we make between four to five uh, measurements and we get the mean uh, length for the surgeon to do the cordae. So as, I, as Michael mentioned before, when the pathology is in the posterior leaflet, the, we measure the distance between the head of the papillary muscle to a coaptation zone in the opposite leaflet, in the anterior leaflet, and we subtract for that distance the length of the prolapse segment. When we are measuring the uh, pathology of the anterior leaflet, we measure from the head of the papillary muscle to the uh, coaptation zone of the posterior leaflet. And when it's a by leaflet prolapse, uh, we proceed to do a combination of both measurements and provide the numbers to the surgeon for them to uh, create the new neocordae. The uh, next step is to establish the severity of the aortic insufficiency, if it's any. Ideally, for this procedure, we want no more than mild aortic insufficiency. And we found quite often that the patient has progression of the disease. So when the patient has more than uh, mild AI, um, due to the difficulties for to provide adequate cardiac protection, the decision is made to convert the procedure to open. So it's important to do assess the uh, aortic valve early uh, in the in our TE exam. The last thing that we do during the, this step is to assess the tricuspid valve. Uh, the decision to uh, repair the tricuspid valve for our surgeons is based on the size of the annulus, the severity of the tricuspid regurgitation, and the symptoms. Uh, so we confirm the findings of the preoperative echo, and we try to do that before we isolate the lung. As I mentioned before, you know, just decrease the quality of the image, especially in the right side of the heart. But also, the uh, one lung ventilation can change the hemodynamics of um, the like the hemodynamics in general and can't um, make difficult to interpret the degree of precursor regurgitation. To, to, so we try to do this early into our TE exam. The second step is the neck uh, pl neck like placement itself. So it's the cannulation of the SVC. So for that, one of our anesthetists is scrub and is in the surgical field. Before that, we try to do a pre scrub scanner to establish an anatomy of the patient. You, uh, ideally, we want to place the line in the right side. So we place two wires, one for the surgical cannula and one for our central line. For that, we use a short and long axis view and we support the findings with TE uh, before we provide heparin to double the uh, ACT or get the ACT over 250. So in the first image in the top left, we see we do a scan before we place any lines. Uh, ideally, we want to place both lines in the same side, in the right side, which is uh, make easier the drainage for the surgeons. But if the anatomy is not uh, favorable, we uh, place our central line in the opposite side or uh, place also the surgical cannula in the other side. Once, once the wires are inside of the 
uh, internal jugular vein, we visualize them in short axis and long axis view. Sometimes it's, as you can see, it's challenging because of the presence of valves. So very early in, into our program, uh, we decided to confirm the presence of the two wires using TE in a by cable or modified by cable view, which uh, facilitates the visualization of the two wires. After the two wires are um, seen in the superior vena cava, heparin um, is going to be uh, applied to the patient. Some potential complications that we see uh, during this cannulation, uh, the most common one is the puncture of the posterior um, wall of the internal jugular vein, creating uh, hematomas that can expand uh, after full heparinization is given. Less common, this is an image uh, from my uh, initial training uh, where a patient, um, after we provide heparin to the patient the, after the placement of the IV, uh, SVC cannula, the patient became uh, very unstable. Uh, we decided to uh, look what was happening. Hypovolemia was found in the left ventricle and we found the volume in the right pleura. Uh, and this patient has a dissecting uh, hematoma of the mediastinum and a conversion of open technique was required to correct this. The third step is the images before we go to uh, CPV. This um, uh, in, in this time, we complete the TE exam like in any other uh, mitral valve repair. It's the same images that we do in the open uh, repair. So we try to um, find the function of the left and right ventricle, the presence of PFO, they need to be closed during the procedure, and um, have images to be able to uh, diagnose potential complications after we come out, come out for bypass. I'm going to dedicate the time to talk about a particular case that is specific of minimal invasion. It is the placement of the IVC cannula. So the placement of IVC cannula is done by the surgeons from the femoral vein. So the first step is to place a wire at the entrance of the SVC. Uh, so it's a dynamic procedure. So we try to uh, use 2D and 3D to help with the placement of the line. Once the line is in the wire is in the adequate position, then uh, the cannula is advanced around one 1.5 centimeters into the SVC to get optimal uh, drainage venous drainage for the patient. And again, we use um, 2D and 3D to confirm the placement of the cannula. Uh, the most common complication is the misplacement of the cannula. We have um, one case of a placement of the cannula inside of the left atrium, so completely rupture of the intraatrial septum. Uh, it's an unusual complication. The most common complication is the um, impossibility to pass the cannula all the way to the SVC, so the cannula have to sit in the um, right atrium, which can be make difficult the drainage of the venous uh, line. So we need to be aware of that and have uh, extra monitors during the uh, intraoperative settings to be able to diagnose this problem. And the last step is the postoperative echo. In this one, we're going to use the same criteria for mitral valve repair in the open approach. Uh, the first step is we're going to uh, help with the de um of the left ventricle before the vent uh, is removed. So this, this can take uh, a little bit of extra time. So the TE is used uh, to guide the process. And then we are going to assess um, the repair itself. We use color to uh, see the degree of residual mature regurgitation. Ideally, we are looking for mild um, level of degree. And we use the 3D to try to establish the location of the residual MR and then decide with the surgeon if it's necessary due to the degree to go back on pump and which specific segment is compromised so the adjustments can be done at that point. Um, also, we mentioned the coarctation length. Uh, for that, we use again 2D and 3D to align um, 
uh, in the segment that was uh, corrected and we're looking for a measurement of one which uh, the papers have showed that is the one that show uh, it's uh, proven to have more durability of the repair so a co-optation length uh, of one we look at in different views and again we use 3d to better alignment of the specific segment and of course we measure the gradients to the new repair The complications that we can find at this stage of the TE or the operation are no particular of uh, minimal invasive. The most common uh, ones that we find at the beginning of our program were hematomas in the aorta for the cardioplegia cannulation site, or in more severe cases, dissections that need to be uh, repaired and convert to an open approach. Um, this particular case was a patient with uh, preoperative images of a prominent circumflex. When the repair was completed, we have difficulties coming off bypass and we find multiple regional wall motion abnormalities in the circumflex territory. We perform an angiogram that shows uh, partial occlusion of the circumflex. So the patient was uh, put again into cardiopulmonary bypass and the uh, surgeon released some stitches of the anuloplasty. After that, the angiogram com showed complete flow into the circumflex and the TE confirmed um, uh, regain of normal contraction of the left ventricle. And also we find uh, some complications uh, typical of mitral valve repair, uh, in, independent of the approach, like for example, the presence on some, some for the patient's hemodynamics or the quality of the repair itself. So it's important to have enough preoperative images that allow us to compare uh, the, the presence of these new findings. So um, in summary, I can say that the TE um, is an um, important tool for the uh, performance of minimal invasive mitral valve repair. We need to keep in mind that it has a limited time to be performed. A step-by-step -step approach will help you to optimize your time and get the best quality possible of the image that help us with the information needed by the surgeon and by you to um, um, perform a successful repair. So it's important to use all the features of the machine and trying to do it in an efficient uh, manner. I want to thank you all for attending this lecture and I hope to see you all during the question session later on. Thank you very much, Hilda, for the excellent content of your presentation. It is a pleasure to work with you and Michael on a daily basis in the OR and uh, we'll have a chance soon to discuss more during the Q&A uh, session. So now I'll hand over to Fabio who will introduce our next speaker. Thank you very much.